Well, I think you may have an inkling of what I'm going to talk about. I have a passion for videotape machines, and I've had it for over 30 years. My first job at Duart, I was hired to be a tape machine repair technician. I repaired pneumatics, three quarter inches, pneumatic, Betacam SPs, and one inches. And as an engineer, I have a drive to, un to want to know how it works, what's under the hood, and to ask questions. So that information became very important very recently when Duart got three projects to conserve. The first one was the Bill Graham archives, and he was the famous concert promoter, rock and roll, from the late 60s to the early 70s, I'm sorry, late 80s. Uh, and um, slews of formats, majority of them were through pneumatic recorders. The second job that we had was the conservation of the um, Bing Crosby early TV shows of the, of the 60s on two inch. And the last job, and most current that we're working on now, is the Leonard Bernstein concert series, including the Young People's Concerts, and most challenging to me, and current on my list of things to do, is that he taped his, one of his shows in 1959 as a Christmas special. It was taped in color. It was shot in New York at NBC Studios, and it is the earliest surviving um, color video tape on the East Coast. So analog is, is an important thing for me to understand because all those, all those materials I described earlier have been migrated to digital and you have to have a good understanding of how to do that and preserve all the quality. So let me take you through some of the technical insights into analog that I've discovered. We've um, talked quite a bit about um, scopes. Mona did uh, just earlier, uh, Heather yesterday, and certainly Joanna. It's quite important. It's a very useful tool to really understanding the intricacies of what takes place under the machine. Um, I won't go into much detail here other than because um, it can be a whole half-day lecture in itself. But things to uh, really to focus on are obviously the waveform monitor, which, um, which uh, Moner elaborated earlier. Um, test signals, uh, and certainly again, empty test pattern is a very useful tool for aligning displays because without a properly aligned display, you may not know what you're looking at. And of course, the vector scope is a reference here of uh, color information, which you mentioned earlier. Uh, new to the, new to the um, set of tools and the way of monitoring is a data scope because these are representing all those uh, two scopes. They are representing the analog world and then we're taking the analog world and converting it to bits. And so we need to know really what's, what is under the hood with the bits. So when did analog recording start? Well, it started on April, I guess it's April 4th, 1956 at the NAB convention. And Ampex, basically, like I just did earlier, they came out to the NAB floor, they rolled their machine out into the, uh, into the conference floor. Everybody was mesmerized, because that was the first time that anyone ever saw videotape. And I'll show you what it looks like. So that's what they unveiled. Two inch videotape. 60 minutes worth. This is actually tape is 60 minutes worth of recording. It was a splash, and of course, it became one of the most long-lived formats, I think until about 1982. So then the next question a lot is, when did analog video recording end? It's kind of a tough question because uh, 
you know, they continue to make machines on and off through various periods of time. So I did a little research, and he's just one of the ways I did that. I was looking through the online uh, uh, archive of uh, the B&H catalogs in, uh, in the uh, archive.org, and I um, determined that uh, Hi8 was the last format at least sold in New York. And of course, this Hi8 tape here is two hours worth of recording. So you can see within a span of time that a tape that weighs 20 pounds, that did 60 minutes, went down to a tape that weighs a couple ounces that does two hours. So that, in essence, is 45 years of analog recording. And during that time, other than those two formats, there were 39 different analog formats. So what is my focus today? I could talk broadly about all the formats, but I think I was going to decide to talk something very specific. And a format that I would think that almost everyone in the audience at least have one in their collection, and really would have been the most widely used format throughout the world in the industrial, educational, art world, even the broadcast world, uh, which is the uh, three-quarter inch Umatic. So when did the um, Umatic start, and why did it start? Well, during the early 60s, after, after Ampex unveiled that two-inch tape, um, very expensive machine. I mean, that was $1956. It was about, uh, I think it was about a $60,000 machine at the time. And the burgeoning market for educational, industrial, uh, was very, was, was definitely a growing market. And all the manufacturers were trying to develop a machine that would fit into that market, be inexpensive, easy to use, um, relatively good quality. It didn't need to be broadcast, but it needed to be good quality. Um, Sony sort of led the way uh, with um, their development of a cassette-based system uh, based upon three-quarter inch tape and um, sort of uh, led the way. Interesting brochure that I found, um, and it's from about 69, and showing the intentions of how Sony wanted to market the three-quarter inch. You'll see that they, they, in essence, thought of it as a home entertainment device to be able to people that they could, you could get from a distributor, you can get a movie that's pre-recorded, you could bring it home to your nice comfy environment, watch a movie and return it, and, um, and have your ability to have um, you know, what you want to see when you want to see it. Interesting enough is that they also make a mention that uh, the taping is expensive and that the distributors can erase the tapes to use them over again because the tape has a lot of longevity. Um, and interesting enough is that because it obviously was a pre, and I read this earlier, they make an interesting a statement here that, that the Umatic was going to be based upon a 100-minute tape. Well, 100-minute tapes never existed in Umatic, so they decided to uh, change that later on to, uh, I guess, increase the quality. So what was the first Umatic that came to the United States? Well, the first Umatic was the um, VO 1600 on the top and the VP 1000 on the bottom, and that was the um, first two machines that came into um, the States in about 1972. It was um, also um, the Sony machine and the Panasonic machine were the, really the only two machines of that period, and even at, later on, that um, had a TV tuner in them. Uh, it was the ability to, um, you know, you can set your tuner there. They sold an external uh, timer that you could uh, hook up to the VCR and uh, record off the, um, the air um, your own content at home. Um, obviously, this is way before um, Betamax. And that happened to be my first VTR myself. When I was in, uh, when I was in high school in mid-1975, I got a 1600, because who wouldn't have uh, wanted to be able to record their programs off the air while, uh, you know, they were, you know, supposed to do homework. And they, uh, and of course, I bought it. It didn't work, so I had to learn to fix it. So a lot of other manufacturers got into the, um, 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 uh, manufacturing of pneumatics, because it wasn't just a Sony um, or a Panasonic device. NEC uh, 
in the early 70s, they were marketing it toward the um, industrial corporate market there for means of corporate distribution of content for sales or uh, marketing. Uh, JVC got into the um, uh, market uh, with their top loader machine uh, in the 70s uh, for the educational market. In fact, I remember that, was that particular machine in um, high school. We, they had them in the TV studio there. And um, they had a nickname there called the Tape Manglers. And uh, JVC never really liked that coin, but it was widely used because they really ate tapes and it was a very short-lived product for them. Uh, Sony also in the, uh, came out with the next generation of machines in the uh, 70s. They're top loaders. They're a much more robust uh, machine than the early one. And of course, from that point forward, there was not, not a machine to uh, have a tuner in it built in anymore. It was, now is the focus size shifting from a home entertainment device to a industrial corporate and then the coming of a broadcast device. And that came in the, uh, in, the, in the 80s when Sony came out with the Built as a Tank series, 800 series. And it was designed for broadcasters to uh, go out into, into little inexpensive uh, portable pneumatic machines. They could record their news footage and um, bring it back to the station, cut the piece and put it on the air with very little time. So broadcasters demanded a very robust machine and um, Sony built it. And the last three quarter inch to be made in the, in the certainly in the broadcast line um, and could be considered one of the best pneumatics built is the um, BVU 950. And that machine had all the bells and whistles built in. It had TVCs built in. You had time code boards built in. Um, very, very, um, very nice machine. The last of the industrial machines, because there's two different markets, certainly with Sony, the broadcast side and the industrial side, which educational and um, institutional, uh, was the 9000 series. And um, that was the last machine that uh, Sony made. And I would say that also was around, I think, 2001. Um, during that period, Many people realized, the manufacturers themselves realized, even the aftermarket realized, that the quality of pneumatic was not very good. In fact, you saw earlier examples yesterday of um, ringing and artifacts. It was an inherent um, design flaw in the machine. Standard was set, so really couldn't change it from a manufacturing perspective. But the aftermarket and people like, you know, Record Tech there and uh, came out with modification to convert their standard pneumatic to a high band recorder for better quality. Um, ads in, in local, um, I mean, actually ads, but uh, articles in local uh, institutional magazines uh, were how to modify your machine to get better dubs because people were making dubs and copies and doing it a composite dub is a, is, was not very good and people wanted, to, wanted better quality. They were demanding it, so it was, it was a ground force on the outside to do that. So, uh, I'm sorry, so I said 2001, and actually it didn't really, re it kind of proxy went out in 1998, um, uh, pneumatic production. Quantigy was the last manufacturer of tape. In fact, Sony, Fuji, uh, when you bought a Sony tape or a Fuji tape uh, in the last 10 years, um, it was actually made by Quantigy because they phased out their production earlier. So Quantigy went out of business in 2007. That means that there's no more pneumatic tape being made left in the world. There are tons of pneumatic tape everywhere. It was, there would have to be millions of, of, of tapes that are from the broadcasters and libraries, institutions. It's, it's again, it's one of the most um, um, widely used formats. So what are the principles under the hood that are important for you to know? And I'd like to switch to the, uh, before the slide, I'd like to switch to the camera. Okay, uh, and Mona brought this out um, a little earlier, and I'm just going to emphasize a little bit of a point here, that um, there are two heads on a pneumatic. Hopefully you can see that, and I'll show examples after on the Q&A, we can get a little closer. Uh, two, uh, two heads on a pneumatic, and I'm basically what I'm going to do is just going to thread the tape for a second, and I'm going to turn it off. So, and what I'm going to, basically what I'm showing here is that if this is a head and this is a head, 
uh, tape is wrapping around here. So I, actually, if you didn't get it by now with the earlier example, where do you think the word umata came from? So if you actually look how the tape path is wrapped around the head, it's shaped as a U. So that's how they actually coined the word umatic. You'll see here is that the um, only one head touches the tape at a time. Tape is wrapping around this way, and as it rotates around, the other head comes into play. So it's always one head touching the other, and the um, um, point where the head switch is what they call head switching, is what you saw at the bottom of the picture. So that's a very important um, thing to understand. Can we switch back to the PowerPoint? Thank you. OK, so you have a sort of an understanding of the, um, and that little diagram at the bottom sort of emphasized what I showed you here visually. Uh, what we're looking here is, um, is a um, developed, they took, you can take a, um, a humanic tape, which has magnetic tracks on it, and you can apply a special iron solution on top of that tape to develop the tracks to make them the invisible visible. So what you're seeing here are the tracks that are in the center section of this tape, as you can see, magnified 100 times, so they're obviously very small. And if you're seeing how the, the tape and the head moves, because it, again, one head is touching the tape at a time, and the tape is moving across the head. So you have the tape moving and the heads are spinning. That action causes the tracks to be written one at a time, alternating. So you have head one is, is writing first, head two is writing second. It alternates back to head one, head two, so on and so forth, all the way down the line as the tape moves. Each head is also recording only one field of information. In the world of NTSC, there's two fields to make up a frame. So you have the first field here, second field is here. Interesting thing to point out for, and, and there'll be a lot of examples later on, on interchangeability and, and tracking problems and such, but this is a, this sort of magnifies the, the problem a little bit. Uh, ideal for the tape to play back properly on interchange is that the spacing between the heads should be uniform. If you notice here is that the space is narrower than this space. This is an actually empty recorded space called a guard band. So you can see this is fatter, this is smaller. That's a problem. So that tape would actually play back with a tracking problem in the picture. One of the, one of the reasons why it was developed here. Uh, next slide. So here's, again, we took, and Mona brought this up too. I'm just making a little simplified example of interlaced. So again, we have one head is recording one field and is recording the odd number of lines in the, in the raster. Head two is recording the even number of lines. And the system of display adds the two together. And you see that the lines add together. You form an interlaced picture. So again, interlaced video here, you can see it's very key to understand. And it'll be, be important later on in the display conversation. Also is that when an object moves, if you have a ca camera that pans, and it's an interlaced camera, let's say a video camera, when you pan, and if you step through the fields, you'll see the image had this comb effect. And, you, you know, and that is considered normal. So that's an effect of, of interlaced um, of, of recording and an interlaced um, capture. What is progressive? Well, progressive is, is that on, so on the NTSC system, that, or PAL system, same difference, um, that if you have the same picture in both fields, the same temporal picture in both fields, it's called a progressive image. Even though that the, 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 the heads are picking it up one field at a time, and the, the monitor is adding them together, it's still called a progressive image. So now let's take a look into the image itself. And I got this out of a um, book on the, one of the theories of, uh, of development of NTSC. And it drew upon the principle of um, color printing. And they knew this for eons, that if you 
take a black and white image, and if you make it full resolution, you put all the resolution and detail in the black and white image, you can sacrifice detail in just a color only image. Because when you add the two together, you get a normal picture. It's a very interesting principle. So again, detail on the black and white. You can see here there's very little detail in the color. When you add the two together, it actually winds up to be a normal image. And, and, and a lot of the technologies, even up to the day, today use this principle. So who developed that principle in the world of television? Well, a man named Al Bedford, Marcy Laboratories, um, came up with that idea, and it's actually called the mixed highs principle. And the principle being is that you don't need to have the entire, the entire image doesn't need to be in full resolution. Only the luminance or black and white portion of it needs to be, which is really a thing relating to, um, to television, because in, 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 the, in the photographic world or the printing world, it works in the RGB space. So it really, in the television world, that works in the luminance and chrominance space, it, it works appropriately. Um, so again, full, so the full detail on the luminance and color can be greatly reduced. How much color detail do we need? Well, they determined it um, when they came up with the NTSC system by observers. So they put in a um, they put in a set of these 11 observers in a room with um, a high quality display device, and they varied the color detail and saw where people would just notice the difference, where the, um, what is that point? How much detail do we need to just to be better? And then going past that point, it really doesn't make a, a difference visually. And what they came up with is, if you look at the 50% mark here, approximately, is around half a megacycle. Very important number to hold on to. Because that's what they use in NTSC, and also it's a half a megacycle of bandwidth. It's also the amount of color detail that they used in the Umatic. Here is a um, chart of all the flavors of Umatic around the world. And there are quite a few of them. Uh, in the NTSC world, they came out with two systems called Umatic SP. And they also came out with regular Umatic, which if we have a tape there, we'll show it later. In the PAL world, there's more flavors. Uh, there's PAL low band, PAL high band, and PAL SP. If we look, and if, if we're looking at here, and this term is kind of, I'm going to use it quite a bit. It is the RF spectrum of what's on that tape. Because really what's on the tape is not video, it's RF. What does RF mean? RF is called radio frequency. And think of it this way. Radio waves are um, transmitted over the air. You have a receiver, a tuner in your home that has an FM, you know, FM receiver tuner. And it... Um, Converts the RF into audio, music, sound. Same thing with the world of video. Difference being is that here we're taking a spectrum of space, and what we're doing is that the luminance, the, or they say the chrominance here, which is in the red, is think of it as recorded on one station or one channel in the RF world. The green is the luminance section, record on another channel. So what you do is you have, you know, you have one channel that's for the chrominance, one channel for the luminance, and think of it as, again, you have one station on your receiver for one, you know, w, you know for WCBS, and the other stations uh, on your receiver WNEW, two different frequencies, two different information. Same thing what happens here um, in the tape world. Um, almost all tape machines uh, use this, uh, you, especially, they call this the color under principle. So it's Umatic, uh, uh, SVHS, VHS, uh, Betamax, a um, um, few others. But there's a lot of machines that use this principle. 
So if you look here, and this is the last thing I'll point out on the slide, 688. We saw earlier standard was half a point was 0.5. So Sony actually picked for color detail a little bit the same as, as what the NTSC picked um, many years earlier for that's the amount, of, amount of, the, the amount of detail that is required or just necessary to make a good picture. Oops, wrong road. Next one. Okay. So let's look under the hood, you know, of the UMAG. And this is basically a schematic drawing of a generalized, uh, general UMAG. I'm not going to cover much of the detail here, but I wanted to bring up the point of RF, which, if you look here, these are the two video heads that are on the drum you saw earlier. Um, each one has a separate signal picking up RF off the tape. Each of the, you know, the heads get denoscence combined together into one RF channel. And then the RF channel gets broken up, just basically gets split to two separate tuners. You have one tuner for chrominance, which is in the red color. You have one tuner in the green for the luminance. And if you see, if you track it all the way down here, the red arrow here, the green arrow here, the two get mixed together. The luminance and chromis get mixed together to form composite. It's really the word, the word, the word, the word composite came from. You're a compo it's a composite of luminance and chrominance information together into one signal. That's the video output of the machine. Over here is what they call, I think Mona mentioned a little earlier, it's uh, the dub output of the machine, and that's where you can actually get out luminance information, I'm going to say chrominance information here, and luminance information here separated. Why is that important? So just to recap a little bit, again, we talked about uh, one, head, one head at a time. Uh, it picks up a signal. This signal is called RF. Uh, the RF is coded in the umatic to luminance and chrominance signals. And the video output of the humanic is a composite of both. So I want to look at the first slide, which is clip number one. If you can switch to the video. Great. Um, so let's just look at, we, we talked about what luminance and chrominance is. Let's look at it visually. It's playing. Good. So this is... This is the luminance output of the machine. Black and white information. With dropouts and lots of artifacts. Okay, very important here, and this was, this was a trick to do. The same source, and you're looking at just the chroma. No luminance. And you'll see here, the same scene, very little detail in the image. You can see it looks kind of mushy and kind of soft, very little detail. Again, it's really only, you know, it really winds up being a quarter of the bandwidth of what the luminance is. Same dropouts, you see. So here's a composite of the two, which is what comes out of the video output. And you see, picture, we'll play it here. Picture looks pretty normal. Um, normal looking picture. The basics, of, the basics of composite and separate elements. So here's the question. I have a choice. I can either take composite to digitize um, from a humanic, or I can take this luminance chrominance signal. Which one is better, and what's the difference? Oops. So here's a source, and this is basically a source. Very simple to show. I'll stop it here. This is color bars that are recorded on a humanic that I'm digitizing in to a file. And take a look, and I did it by composite. Take a look at the bottom here. And I'll play it here, and I'm sure you've seen this many times. It's called dot crawl. You always see it on transition. 
between a, um, a dark section and a light section. It's always on an edge, it's always on difference in contrast, and it actually moves. You see it moving here. Why is that happening? That's happening because when you, when you break down composite into, into, um, into the digital world, you have to separate back out the chrominance and luminance internally, and when you do that, you have to apply filters, comb filters, and different types of filters to kind of rip that apart. And by the action of ripping it apart, um, each of them have, have a, um, a defect or make an artifact. Um, so here's the same signal, same tape, that I digitize using the YC. And again, if you look at the edge here now, you see that the edge is clean. There is no dock crawls or any artifacts there. So there is an advantage in, in, in certainly in, the, in, 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 in digitizing and serving to, to go in uh, the YC mode for a um, color under a machine like the Umatic. Okay, I think. Okay, can we switch back to PowerPoint? Next slide. Okay, so just to recap a little bit here to separate the uh, this color from the luminance from the uh, from the composite video, a filter has to get used. Uh, these filters add artifacts, and usually in the world of post production and you know where I come from, uh, we always the philosophy is the less filter, the less processing, the better the picture. Um, and to use the luminance chromatics as a separate means is a much better way to digitize. So taking the uh, luminous chroma signal from the Umanic, which we determined is the better way of going, um, should I go to a tape or a file? Hmm. Digital Betacam, Uncompressed, DV tape, MPEG-2, DVDs, hmm. all sorts of things, the choices. How do I know which one will preserve all the image qualities of the Umanic? Perplexing question. So I came up with a very, uh, I came up with a, Way a test, um, a pattern. And I'll sh come up in the next slide, and if we can switch to the clip, next clip, clip two. Move this. Okay. Um, so I came up with an intuitive pattern. It's it's, it's well used in the industry. Um, it's called a zone plate, and it is a, um, you could, it's, it's a pattern that stresses um, the system that you're testing, and you'll see it in a second. And so I'm basically going to record this pattern, and I record it on this pattern as, you know, as, um, um, as, as luminance only, and I'm playing it back as luminance only just to test how the luminance of the, t of the umatic is being handled. And if you look at the pattern, and I'm stopping it here, because one of the things you think about this pattern is it's also display de uh, display device um, um, uh, important because display devices also can trip up the pattern and make artifacts, as you're seeing at the bottom here, with these type of moray patterns. But I'll play it, and you'll, you'll see it's different. Now, Things that really, just to point out, and what I'm pointing out here in this pattern, don't say it out too long there because you'll get hypnotized, uh, that um, it is a, is a series of concentric circles. And as you see, as you get further out in the circles, the, cir the, the circles get um, thinner and closer together. So the further you get out, the more resolution there is in the image. In addition to any of these type of um, things that you see, beatings or artifacts, i play it again, uh, taking place, um, that's artifacts in the system, either in the machine or in the um, device itself. So it's, it's a very strenuous test. So the more circles you see, the better the quality. So this is humanic. Um, resolution is pretty good. A little bit on the edge here, but not too much. Now, let's look at the same pattern in chrominance only. Quite a bit different. So now, if you look at it, and this is recorded the same way, um, just chrominance only, no luminance. So you see that where we talked about earlier that uh, 
um, half a megacycles of bandwidth for the equivalents that they allocated to the umatic. Well, it's showing up here because, I'll play it a little bit. You see that, you see very little information here. This is all mush. Really, the information is really here. Very little bandwidth. It's just there's, there's that little much, there's that little bandwidth in a umatic. I would say probably very typical of color under systems. Actually, PAL would have a little bit more bandwidth because the, the, they, they, they need a little more bandwidth for PAL, but they have to sacrifice other qualities for um, the tape running at 25 frames a second. Okay. So I think that's it. Okay. So I want to say, okay, mm, I've had a lot of people, uh, we make deliverables and people are asking us an archive, we want a uh, DV cam as an, uh, or a DV file, 25 megabit DV file as an archive means or a deliverable. Okay, how does this particular pattern react to um, DV? So actually you can see it's actually quite good. Actually you get less, less of that, it's up here, get actually less of the beating you saw earlier on the umatic. It was you know, so it actually looks, and the luminous side is better. Um, here you can see the, uh, the rings go out to the, to the end. You didn't, you had a little bit of uh, um, deformation here on the umatic. So actually on the luminous side, it's actually, um, it's a little bit better than the umatic's quality. That's a, that's a good thing. How is it on the chroma side? So here you can see that um, we have not quite as much, but we have a tremendous amount of loss in the chroma. And the, um, and I'm sure that'll be talked about early, uh, later, and I know it was mentioned earlier, that's, there's one of the reasons I won't get into it, but that's why we have 422 and 420 and 411 and 444, all relates to color um, detail in the digital world. But there is a loss. As you can see, there is a loss in the DV cam. Not the ideal format for archiving in the chrominance. So, people want MPEG-2. They put MPEG-2s in their playback servers for the uh, display of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a video or an art. They want DVDs. Some people just want DVDs. I want you to take my two inches, make me DVDs of it for, uh, that's what I consider an archive. So I says, okay, let's run the same test. And this, this can be a very, very subjective test, too. So what I did is I, uh, I did it at the highest bit rate for a DVD, which was, I think it was 9.4 megabits per second. Uh, I also did it on the best encoder that um, is available, um, and I, which is called a digital vision. And because uh, I didn't want to have the encoder be an influence on, on the, on the um, signal, I wanted it to be the, the MPEG itself. So here's the luminance for the, um, and actually you can see, you know, actually looks pretty good. There is some, there's actually some kind of micro-blocking taking place down here. But you can see the rings that were pretty, they were pretty, they were pretty good out to the end, so it was not um, um, very little loss in the, um, in the luminance side. Let's look at the chroma. Oh, now, look at this. You're getting lost in a different direction. This is, you know, before you were losing over here on the, um, on the, um, on the DV cam and pneumatic. Here we're losing in the other direction. So I think if you add the two together, you probably have very little chroma. Pneumatic's loss and, DV, and the MPEG-2's loss. That was a shocker. Okay. So, and I think one of the most common archival formats, at least out there, um, in the tape world is digital beta cam, we talked about um, earlier. And, um, and digital beta cam, and I'm, it's going to be equivalent to saying that it's an uncompressed file. Um, which, you know, it's pretty close to being uncompressed, so we'll, we'll purpose intend it's, it's an uncompressed file. It's 4 to 2, so let's take a look at how the digital beta cam handles that same test. 
quite good. See all the rings, very clear, very little artifacts in the bottom. This may be the projector here, but this is pretty, pretty clean. Let's look at the chroma. Much better, much better. We can see a lot of detail, and I'm gonna play it for a second, I have the clips are relatively short. As you can see, it's, you want to stop and start. It's, we have a lot of detail. So, um, as you can see, it's, you know, it's an intuitive thing, and I think it shows some of the pros and cons of different formats. Okay, can we switch back to the PowerPoint? Okay. Oh, it was a light? Oh, the light didn't see the light. All right, so the last thing I'll wrap up there and see the light here. Sorry about that. Um, the, um, let's go to the next slide, and I'll just wrap up with this one quickly. And I think the question was asked earlier was um, between 8-bit and 10-bit. What's my choice? And I made a very intuitive way of view to, to show it. Uh, and this is why it's important, because 8-bit um, and 10-bit is a big com controversy. Uh, and 12-bit's coming uh, even, even more. Digital cinema is 12-bit. So it's important to understand what bits are. Move it a little long. So what's a bit? Quickly, to show that you have an analog signal, which is the purple waveform you see here. This here is sampling that takes place on the analog waveform. So you know, you have to convert a point in time and a, and a voltage to a, a digital sample. So the more samples you have, these points here, points here, points here, points here, the more samples you have, the more you're representing the analog waveform. Can we just go to the, um, to the last clip, I guess, third clip? Okay, so I guess we'll wrap with this. Let's play the clip. So I'm using a test signal called a shallow ramp. Shallow ramp is a, um, and you'll see here, is a um, low contrast signal. It's very shallow, low contrast, very, um, you'll see, and I have a graphical representation of the signal. You see here, this is a graphical representation of a waveform. You see that it's very shallow. It's taking a very, um, it's a little bit of, it's very sh shallow, low contrast signal. Good signal to test the, this principle with. I'm going to show you. So it raises the question. We'll get to the next slide. Okay. Someone digitizes um, a video from analog. Um, it was happened to be low contrast, or they misadjusted the TPC, or whatever. I need to fix the video to be able to um, bring the contrast back, bring the blacks down to raise the whites. So this is what I did. I took the, the shallow signal. I digitize it in 8-bit, and then I stretch it out to bring back a normal contrast. Take a look what happens here. If you see here, and I'm going to stop it, that there is all sorts of gradations of modeling taking place. It's not a smooth signal. There's a lot of break up here. It's not so apparent on the screen, but there is a lot of, Beckley over here, a lot of breakup in modeling. And if you look at the graphical representation of it, so this is my stretch signal, you're starting to see steps. Let's take a look at the same signal um, brought in as 10-bit. Same thing happens, same amount of contrast. Look here, actually it's much smoother. Not at this breakup or, you know, modeling or, and you see here, much smoother. A lot more steps, much smoother. So it was able to handle the um, contrast change better. So 8-bit or 10-bit, I'll let you um, be the judge. Um, how much time? Zero. Zero. <laughs> Then I guess I will uh, wrap up. Um, I guess we have a little. Take a, take a minute. I'm sorry. But did you appreciate the question? Please wrap up. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to. No. Well, All right. So we, we, let me just move it to the next slide. Let's see here. Anyway, I don't want to jump through this. We'll go to the last. Oops. Anyway. 
Thanks. Say hello, um, So we can talk about analog and digital um, for a very long time. It's certainly a broader topic than the little slot that's um, taught here. And I just brought down some, some just key examples of why it's important. And just to raise the thought that really when you, when you hear something or when someone says something is better than another, that's my engineering background, I need to prove it to myself. I don't like to listen to what someone else says. I need to prove it to myself to see if what someone's telling me is correct. And um, to me, pictures are a thousand words, and uh, that's how I generally make decisions. So another thing, too, is I want to mention that during the coffee break, um, we were going to have our nice little machine here on the side. And we'll have one thing that was mentioned about uh, care and maintenance of BTRs, and was talked about earlier about cleaning. So we can uh, have a little workshop here and just show you how to clean the heads, because I think that's a good task to know. I think I'm done. Two fantastic talks, and I'm sorry to be vigilant on the time, but I think the question and answer I was hoping for the hook. I, you were hoping, yeah. you almost got the hook. Um, so questions, please. And if you could come to the mic uh, to ask questions, that'd be great. And I'll get um, I'm actually curious about the history of the cassette and how that was developed and implemented. Well, I, I'll say that um, Certainly, the cassette has been um, had a lot of implementation before Sony. You saw that prototype slide there in '68, there of that first Umatic cassette, which actually was a, never appeared the way you see it here. Um, there were other manufacturers uh, in the '60s trying to um, come up with um, a um, a containerized version to hold video. This is a very <laughs> awkward thing that you kind of have to do this and you kind of have to thread it around machines. It's not something that the user or, you know, people kind of, they don't, you know, it's not, it, was, it wasn't a user-friendly thing. And I think it started in the late 50s there with RCA and other people coming out with the uh, first versions of the compact audio cassettes. So they saw how well that worked for audio tape. They wanted to migrate that to, um, to video, same user-friendliness. Any other questions? Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the preservation of half-inch reel-to-reel videotape. Um, it's my understanding, and I have very limited understanding that. That's a whole other topic. That it's that it's like very like a lot of this material is very degraded. A lot of the early video art was made on half-inch. So I'm just wondering. Mm -hmm. I know it's a really in-depth subject. Well, I mean. Um, we're in trouble. We're in trouble with video anyway, analog. I, I hate to tell you, but um, we're in trouble with uh, decks, and we're in trouble with people and who know how to do that work on that, on those tapes. I mean, they always need to be treated because of sticky shed, basically, um, because of the moisture introduction of moisture over time and the change in the chemical change in the in the binder system. Um, sometimes they even come off the reel like artist tape or something. It's horrible. <laughs> Actually, um, there are people in the room who do this half-inch open reel transfer all the time. But basically, um, you, it, they need to, usually need to be treated, and they, could, uh, they do need to be treated always. I mean, I guess I would say almost always. Um, and they can be treated by dehydration, which some people use baking to do that, or um, desiccating through an through an oven um, at, at certain temperatures over time to dehydrate, or you can dehydrate with desiccants. Um, and um, there, one of the big problems is that we have very few half-inch open reel cleaning machines. So cleaning machines can be helpful to get debris, loose debris off of a tape. And um, there are I mean, I pretty much know all the cleaning machines around the world, and they're on less than two hands. <laughs> there might be only on one hand, you know, 
here in New York, one in San Francisco, one in, two in Australia, you know, two in Berne or whatever. You know, I mean, it says more than one hand. But we have, so it's very hard for uh, people to take that format and work with that format outside of the vendors um, who are the, and there are very few vendors. So, I mean, if you have half inch open real material, you need to keep it in good storage and you need to try to get it transferred as, as quickly as possible. I mean, this is sort of goes to this whole issue of, you know, that we all exist together in this kind of media ecology system, ecological system for media. And, you know, yesterday, um, Joanna was talking about the last, uh, well, the last duplication house for 16 millimeter or 16 millimeter processing, whatever um, it was, but it, that basically they're going out, all these companies are going out of that business. And um, they're same, I mean, with half inch as well, there are limited vendors. So we really need to have a whole alternatives within the nonprofit sector for doing transfer. And what's happening is that, you know, you're going to look around one day for a vendor and there aren't going to be any vendors because there aren't going to be any machines. So my feeling is that museums, you know, the whole collections really need, we need to work together with in other people in independent media and the library and archive material in a very serious way to start to establish more places for half and show and real and other really, um, and pneumatic's a big problem too. We need to have more people transferring tapes. So we need to have more people trained to do that and we need to, to not have it be a mysterious process that only a few people can do and only exists in a few parts of the country. And, you know, we just had a very big house packs go out this year. And they, they went out of business and they also had a whole bunch of information on the website about, you know, historical information that went out. So, you know, we need a mix of vendors and nonprofits and we need to work together because those vendors are not going to be out there. Um, I always get in a bad mood. Once. Well, but you know, I'm not actually in a bad mood. Maybe, I'm just sad. But it's well, it's it's the same way with you know all you know the thing is is it's vendors are vendors are driven by profit. I mean we have to be we all have to make money and um, you know with 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 older equipments it gets to be very challenging because they require a lot of care. The parts are impossible to find, they take specialized expertise to keep them running. And then the media itself, I mean, you know, when you, you know, the, a humanic is a lot easier to deal with than a, uh, than a uh, open reel because it's, it's, it's much newer in, 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 in technology. So every tape, uh, those tapes get to be a challenge to play and you play it and you make a transfer and suddenly it stops working and you got to do it over again and it takes your time and it's, um, but it, one of those things that People should be thinking about doing it now. Because the longer you wait, the less equipment, the less talent, the less people, the less everything there will be. And you'll have a tape, you know, there won't, you know, won't be a time when that, there'll be a time when this two inch, there won't be a machine to play it. And then there'll be just a paperweight. And I can tell you two stories. I mean, one is that over one year, one, one year it was like, I'll look at that deck for $75 and no mention of any problem with parts. The next year, I can get that, uh, it'll cost me you $200 to look at that deck, and I don't know if I can get the parts after I, you pay me $200. So, you know, that's the situation with half-inch open reel. Um, sad. Go ahead, Steve. It, I mean, is there um, in, like, is there any hope in terms of, like, like maker culture or people who are working outside of industry, um, sort of hot-rodding this equipment? Uh, have, I mean, you know, I know there's a lot of uh, projects like that in robotics and and sort of repurposing lots of equipment. So I don't know if if you have any experience in terms of specifically with videotape well, technology. Well, I'll say this. I mean, like any of the YC out, we had to modify the machine ourselves to do that because it wasn't available. But you're saying the maker the maker world, um, and you're from San Francisco, so you would know. Um, there's a convention that's held in California called Make Fair. And it's all the young people that are uh, taking objects and are repurposing them, redesigning them, re-engineering them. There, it's all the younger generation of uh, people that are super creative in technical field. Uh, this coming, uh, this fall, is the first Make Fair in New York, first time ever. So we'll see what kind of talent there is. It's you know, it's 
Have I to. tell you, um, for vi Half Inch Open Real, I think if we could get together and buy and buy a bunch of heads, you know, it costs a lot of money to manufacture one head or two heads or five heads. If we get a bunch of heads made, you know, then we have an opportunity to actually get right. some stuff, you know, to work on things. That's really crucial that we get a bunch of heads made. The other thing is, like the cleaning machines, I mean, one in Australia that I saw was basically an uh, RTI machine. They make cleaning machines for cassettes onto the, a video, a video, I mean, an audio machine. So, you know, I mean, somebody out there, does anybody, that's not my area of expertise, making a cleaning machine, but we need, we need that. So we need to have people out there, yeah, trying to make new um, devices that are going to help us transfer the tapes, because otherwise, very few are going to get transferred. We need to take the money that we're paying for storage and put it into into getting things. And we transferred. could pick up that conversation over here when we're doing the little demo. Thank you. So we'll be back here at 11:30.